<coughs> okay, so since the recording is starting again, this is our signal that it's time to finish the break and go back to our uh, workshop. So uh, it's a great, I mean, now we are, uh, it's a great pleasure to host uh, the IBS Physics Colloquium today inside our conference, our, uh, our workshop on quantum many body dynamics, thermalization and its violation. Now, as most of you already know, the IBS Colloquium is a joint activity which involves all the IBS physics centers, which are based and located in the Dijon area. Now in this, uh, pandemic time, we are extending a little bit the activity to involve also the other PCS, uh, the other IBS centers outside the Dijon area. And today is a great pleasure to have uh, in our uh, IBS physics colloquium, Professor David Logan from Oxford. So let me introduce a little bit uh, Professor Logan. So he got his PhD in 1982 with the, from University of Cambridge with the thesis on the dielectric, dielectric theory of fluids. After that, he moved, he had few postdoctoral appointments, uh, including some highly prestigious places in US like University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And then uh, he went back to UK and he became a professor in, uh, in Oxford in 1986. And since then he is a professor in Oxford. Now, uh, Professor Logan has many different broad research interests among them, uh, let's say is condensed matter theory, many body quantum and statistical mechanics. And in recent years, he's probably focusing mostly in, in many body, in the physics of many body localization. And indeed today colloquium will be about uh, Fox space correlations and many body localization. So David, uh, I, I would like to ask you to start the colloquium. Thank you. Dario, well, thank you very much for your kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. My warm thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this excellent workshop. Uh, a good morning, good afternoon, or, or good evening to you all, according to where you may actually be. We'd all much rather meet up in person, but such in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. As Dario mentioned, I'm from the University of Oxford. I also want to mention, however, my strong attachment to that wonderful institution, the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, where I have a visiting position in, in the Department of Physics and to which I am uh, deeply attached. Now, the specific work that I'm going to talk about when I, when I get to it here has been done primarily with a, an outstanding postdoc, Stephen D. Roy, uh, who's been a postdoc at the Condensed Matter Theory Group at Oxford for the last uh, three and a half years, working mainly with John Chalker and myself. And before that, he did his PhD with Roderick Mustner uh, at PKS Dresden. So by way of what this talk is going to be about, I'm going to begin with a somewhat extended introduction and background. And then substantively, I'm going to turn to looking at some aspects of many body localization viewed from the perspective of the Fox space in which the phenomenon is arguably rooted. Uh, as part of that, we'll come across something that we regard as, as reasonably important called maximally correlated uh, disorder. And uh, we'll then look at the uh, maximally correlated disorder towards the end of the talk in the context of Anderson localization on graphs and arguably a more controlled setting, certainly from the perspective uh, of numerics on the problem. All right, now the, the theme of this workshop is of course thermalization and its violations. In other words, of ergodicity and ergodicity breaking in quantum many body systems. And as is abundantly clear from the talks, all the talks that we've heard, it's an enormously diverse and exciting field. It's one with many interlinked strands of thinking and investigation to it, and one which has generated vast excitement over many, many years, and indeed an excitement which I think is obvious from the talks we've heard, that continues unabated, in large part because of the as many as yet unresolved questions that there are in it. Now, ergodicity, via the ergodic hypothesis and our modern understanding of it, uh, via as embodied rather of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, Ergodicity is by tradition an almost sacred notion in physics for it's via the, the ergodic hypothesis that equilibrium statistical mechanics is able to collect the microscopic world of particles to bulk thermodynamics. Bulk thermodynamics specifiable by only a few macroscopic parameters 
and without remnant memory of the microscopic conditions with which the system uh, was initiated. So the familiar basic understanding here, of course, is that if we consider an overall isolated quantum system, then the remainder of the system can act as a bath for a local subsystem within it. A bath, if you will, of communicable information, such that the attainment of ergodicity goes hand in hand with the growth of entanglement throughout the system and local observables equilibrate to their thermal expectation values. Now, given the near ubiquity of thermalization, the fact, if you will, that it's the expected default option, it's more than slightly exciting to uncover and to understand classes of systems which fail to thermalize and, and instead exhibit broken ergodicity and which do so more over robustly in the sense that their existence as phases of matter isn't simply a matter of fine tuning uh, physical parameters. So what could break ergodicity in isolated quantum systems? Well, to achieve that, the system must evidently fail to act as a bath for subsystem, the intuition being that one needs to stop or suppress the different parts of the system from communicating effectively with each other, uh, thereby suppressing the spread of correlations and entanglement. And, and one robust mechanism for doing just that, at least in one dimensional systems, is disorder, quenched random disorder, combined with the interactions between the constituent particles and leading to a many body localized phase. Now the genesis of this goes back, of course, well over 60 years, 63 years, to Anderson's seminal paper on absence of diffusion in certain random lattices, in which he famously discovered the phenomenon of disorder-induced localization, specifically, of course, in one particle system. So considering a particle, uh, hopping at a lattice is a body to simple tight binding model here, for example, with each lattice site subject to a non-correlated random potential. Anderson showed that if the disorder strength in general is sufficiently large, then a localized phase exists in which the single particle states, instead of being, say, block-like states or coherent superpositions is the same, are exponentially localized in space. And the characteristics of localized single particle states are, of course, extremely well known. Uh, in one dimension, we have a vanishing critical disorder strength. All states are localized no matter how weak the disorder. There's area law entanglement in the eigenstates. There's no charge transport. And as I mentioned, you have exponentially localized single particle states with support in only a finite number of real space orbitals. In other words, a vanishing fraction of the underlying Hilbert space of the problem. Now, when we move to many body localization, we have, of course, many particles hopping a lattice. Each lattice site is subject to a random potential. We now have interactions between the quantum particles. And many body localization, put roughly, is the fate of Anderson localization upon adding interactions between the quantum particles, particularly, and as far as I'm concerned in this talk exclusively, at finite energy densities above the ground state. In other words, in the middle of, say, the towards the middle of the eigenvalue spectrum, the spectrum of eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, at a finite energy density above the ground. There's been a vast amount of work on this, you know, over the last 15 plus years. I don't have time or don't have the ability to, to list anywhere near the totality of papers, but there are two particularly good reviews to which I would draw, draw the attention of anyone who doesn't already know them. Now, the questions that arise here are clear. Uh, we know that if we have no interactions in 1D for all disorder strengths, we have localized states. What happens when you switch on interactions between the particles? Is ergodicity restored immediately? Or by contrast, does an MBL phase exist in the thermodynamic limit such that if you start off with some interaction strength, ramp up your disorder, there exists a transition between an ergodic and a many body localized phase. What are the mechanisms that underpin the stability of, of an MBL phase? What's the nature of that phase and how does it differ from Anderson localization? And in particular, obviously, what's the nature of the MBL transition? These are all big questions, many facets of which have been addressed in the last 20 odd years of many questions about which still remain and attract the excitement of many people. So I've already mentioned uh, some of the characteristics of Anderson localized states. When you move to many body localization and many body localized phase, uh, there are similarities and there are differences. The most important difference is that there is now a finite critical disorder strength and a phase transition between an ergodic and an MBL phase. So for example, if I sit in the middle of the eigenvalue spectrum here, it's 0.5 in the scale and progressively ramp up the disorder at a certain critical disorder, one that 
We don't really know precisely yet, as we heard the devil and the witches talk, but a certain critical value of the disorder is a transition from an ergodic to an MBL phase. In the MBL phase, there's area law entanglement of the eigenstates again, no charge transport. But now MBL eigenstates have support on an exponentially large number of Fox based basis states, the, the many body counterpart of the single orbitals you have in one body localization. Although I would point out that while the support is on an exponentially large number of Fox based basis states, that's still a vanishingly small fraction of the total number of Fox based basis states. Now, as far as models are concerned, we typically study interacting 1D lattice models for spins half or equivalently spinless fermions under Jordan Wigner. Uh, the models studied are typically local in space, though not all of them. The quantum random energy model, for example, which I'll mention shortly, is formulated directly in Fox space. And I've just mentioned a few of them here because I'll talk in particular uh, primarily about the first one here. And the first is a disordered transverse field Ising model where you have random fields coupling to the Z component of the local spin and any real space side L of which the total number is N. These are independent random variables. You have an Ising interaction between nearest neighbor spins and you have a spin flip term embodied here in the spin flip operator with a strength gamma. The random XXZ model or equivalently spinless fermions is a little bit more complicated, but it's basically the same sort of thing you have an Ising interaction here, you have the random fields acting in the local Z component of the spin, and you have the transverse uh, exchange interaction. If J is equal to JZ, this is just the, the familiar Heisenberg model. We have disorder P spin models and so on and so forth. P equal to two here being the famous case of Sharon Kirkpatrick. Now, as far as approaches to many body localization is concerned, at least in my own mind, there, there are, I think of there being sort of three basic classes. And the first of these, but which we've heard a lot, is large scale numerics based on exact diagonalization, various time evolution methods, et cetera. Methods which then give you a handle on well, anything you can calculate of the system sizes you can calculate, spectral properties, persistent memory of initial states after a long time, characteristic of a, a broken ergodic uh, phase, transport or absence of transport of conserved quantities, eigenstate entanglement, et cetera. Now, these methods are seriously powerful. Their limitation, of course, as we've heard, is the system size that you could reach. You could only do something like 20, whatever it is, spins, but nevertheless, nobody in their right mind would fail to use such techniques where they can. The second classes of approaches, I, I refer to loosely as phenomenological RG, although these certainly start from uh, the very important insight uh, of the MBL phase as an emergent form of integrability characterized by an extensive number of quasi-local conserved quantities, the local integrals of motion or L bits. And a basic and important recognition in such approaches is the entropic inevitability, even deep in an MBL phase, of a finite density of ergodic grains or segments, the, the red region in the figure here, where the random fields acting on the spins therein are sufficiently small that the grains are, if you will, locally ergodic and where the ergodic grains can couple to the MBL regions on an exponentially decaying length scale set by the L-bit localization length zeta. So the question here is whether the ergodic grains grow at the expense of the MBL regions, destroying the MBL phase, or whether by contrast they don't, and the MBL phase is stable. And there's an evident competition between the exponential decay of the coupling and the size of the ergodic grains which enables the construction at least approximately of RG rules for the growth or otherwise of the ergodic region, and which leads to the conclusion that the transition occurs once the L-bit localization length exceeds a finite value and that it's of cost of the Thales type. And then the third class of approaches to many body localization, one which I think is, 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 is the least explored and for which there's a lot of potential is what I call Fox based base theory where you view many body localization as an Anderson localization problem on the Fox space graph associated with the problem you're considering. So there's some aspects of that that I'd like to talk about in this talk. So I'm gonna consider MBL from the perspective of the Fox space in which arguably the phenomenon could be thought of as being rooted. Uh, and the two basic questions I want to ask here are, are simple enough to state. First, 
what's the nature of the disorder in the Hamiltonian defined in the underlying Fox space graph? And indeed, why is that an important question to ask? And secondly, can we say anything about minimal properties that are required for a disordered many body system to sustain a stable MBO phase? So we begin here from the fact that any many body Hamiltonian can be recast as a tight binding Hamiltonian under an underlying Fox space graph. Uh, this isn't rocket science. If I take a Hamiltonian H and split it into H naught plus H1, then in the basis of states of H naught, H naught is by construction diagonal. That's the diagonal term in the tight binding uh, model, while by construction H1 will be off diagonal. And as far as we'll be concerned, these Fox space basis states or Fox space sites, as I'll call them, I, are sigma Z product states. So if we take H0 to be the Ising interaction of the random fields, the basis states here are product basis states in which you specify the local Z component of spin at each and every real space site in the system. And the Fox space site energies epsilon I, which enter the Fox space Hamiltonian follow immediately. As for the hoppings, if I consider say the disordered transverse field Ising model with a spin flip term with strength gamma, those hoppings are either gamma or zero. It's gamma if Fox space sites I and K differ by a single spin flip of a real space spin at any one particular site. Now, when you start from this perspective, the point is this, and yet it's not a particularly useful point. The, the point is that you can now ask exactly the same questions that you would ask about a regular Anderson localization problem. The answers will of course be different but at least in principle, you can ask the same question. However, to make any progress at all with this mapping, there are two obvious things you need to know. The first is, what is the structure of the Fox space graph, or if you will, the lattice on which that effective tight binding Hamiltonian lives? And secondly, given that disorder is entering the tight effective tight binding Hamiltonian here by the Fox space site energies, what can we say about the probability distributions of these Fox space segments? So let me deal with the first issue first, the structure of the Fox space graph. So you can represent Fox space by graph, a lattice, if you will, consisting of nodes or Fox space sites, the, the green dots here that represent the basis state, and with bonds or edges, the gray lines that indicate the non-zero matrix element. And obviously the dimension of this Fox space, NH, is necessarily exponentially large in the number of real space sites. So for example, for the tra disorder transverse field Ising model, it's two to the N. I have N spins, N real space spins, each of them could be up or down. The Fox space dimension is clearly at two to the power N. In other words, it lives on the corners of an N dimensional hypercube. I'm not very good at thinking in my mind of the corners of an N dimensional hypercube. <laughs> I like a two dimensional picture. So here's a way of thinking about the Fox space graph for the disorder transverse field Ising model. Again, its dimension is two to the power n. I've shown it here for n equals 10 spin simply. So at the top, we have a Fox space site with some arbitrary configurations of spins. I, I've shown it here as all up, but it could be anything. At the bottom, we have the spin flipped image of that. In this case, all spins down. It's clear that the first row of this Fox space must contain precisely n entries one nodes or Fox space sites in which one of the real space spits, uh, spins that you had here is flipped from up to down. And in general, it's obvious there are going to be n plus one rows of this Fox space graph, and row m will contain n choose m nodes or Fox space sites. So the important point I want to notice here is that the coordination number of any Fox space site, in other words, the number of other Fox space sites to which it's connected under a non-zero hopping in the effective tight binding model is precisely N. In other words, it is extensive, it's thermodynamically extensive. The features I've just mentioned here are common to Fox space graphs of the other models that I've talked about. The underlying Fox space can look somewhat different. I will actually, before I forget, uh, the, the, the bonds here and hoppings obviously confer the lattice or graph with a distance metric. That's the Hamming distance R, it's the shortest path between any pair of nodes on the graph. So there's another example of the Fox space graph for the uh, XXZ model. It's somewhat different in structure, but it is the two common characteristics that I mentioned before, 
namely the dimension of it is exponentially large in the number of real space sites. And the mean coordination number of it is again, thermodynamically extensive. All right, so the first two essential points here, the dimension of the graph on which the tight banding model lives is exponentially large in the system size and the connectivities of the graph are extensive. There's another very important point. Suppose I ask, what is the probability distribution over an ensemble of realizations, disorder realizations, that any Fox space site picked at random from the lattice will have a particular Fox space site energy epsilon i? Well, that follows by the central limit theorem. It's a normal distribution, and the effective variance of the Fox space site energies is extensive. In other words, the width of this distribution of one body of, of, of one body distribution of site energies lives on the scale of root n. And the same is true of the total density of states. The total density of eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, that too has a variance that's extensive. Its width lives on the scale of root n. And then finally, let me say here that while the connectivities of the graph are extensive, you shouldn't beguile yourself into thinking that. This problem is effectively an Anderson, a regular Anderson problem on a high dimensional graph. MBL and Fox space is not a standard Anderson problem on a high dimensional graph. And that's because of the presence of Fox space correlations, which is now what I'm going to talk about because it takes me to the second question that we needed to answer, namely the probability distributions of the underlying Fox space segment. And the situation here is radically different from the case of one body Anderson localization. In one body Anderson localization, we have as many independent random variables, the bare site energies, as we have sites in the system. Whereas in the present problem, you obviously have exponentially many Fox space site energies, epsilon i, but they're only order n random variables. That's the random variables associated with the disordered fields, disordered exchange couplings, or whatever it is that you have, and that implies then that the Fox space site energies must be strongly correlated. So how then are they correlated? So for simplicity, let me assume that the exchange, uh, that the, the Z coupling between the Ising spins here is, 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 is not distributed, it's, it's simply a constant number. And we have, of course, random fields. So you can split the Fox space site energy epsilon i into two terms. The first of these, let me call it epsilon i prime, is clearly disorder dependent. The second of them, let me call it epsilon i zero, is clearly disorder independent. Jz here is, is, is constant, but it's distributed over the Fox space site. Different Fox space sites will have different values for this term uh, epsilon i zero. We refer to that as configurational disorder. And in fact, at heart, it's configurational disorder that's responsible for the re-entrant behavior of the phase diagram as a function of interaction strength in, in say, uh, XXZ models. So, Going back to the first term here, which is clearly disorder dependent, we can ask what's the probability density of some little d-dimensional subset of these epsilon i primes over disorder realization? Where, where the dimensionality uh, little d here could go anywhere from the full Fox space dimension down to one, the one body distribution of this term. And the answer to that question could be shown, be shown sort of obvious in the sense that the conditions for the multivariate central limit theorem are satisfied, it's a multivariate Gaussian distribution. We can actually ask a similar question of the disorder independent parts, the epsilon i zero. We can ask what's the probability density of some d-dimensional subset of those over the Fox space sites or Fox space lattice. In this case, the dimensionality of that subset divided by the total Fox space dimension must vanish in the thermodynamic limit for this to be a meaningful thing to look at. But you know, so for example, in physical terms, you could imagine the distribution of a Fox space site and all of its neighbors, extensively large number of neighbors, up to some given Hamming distance uh, r, Hamming distance, and that too is a multivariate gas. So the overall distribution of the Fox space site energies is then, whoops, just a convolution of these two things, and since a convolution of two Fox uh, uh, multivariate Gaussians is also a multivariate Gaussian with a covariance matrix that is sum of the two, this two is a d-dimensional uh, multivariate guys. All right, so to summarize it at this stage, the diagonal part of the Hamiltonian you have is just order n 
random numbers, the random fields, and shall we say the random uh, couplings. These generate the exponentially many Fox space site energies and leads to exponentially many such linked pairs in Fox space. So for example, if I imagine flipping an upspin here in red to down in the presence of two upspin neighbors, there's a certain energy difference when I do that. And that's exactly the same energy difference I get when I flip the spin from up to down in the presence of the two upspin neighbors, regardless of the spins on all the other sites in the real space. That's now, suppose now we ask ourselves, let's consider a set of Fox space sites that are some finite Hamming distance R away from some initial Fox space site I. We know that the distribution, the one body distribution of that initial Fox space site uh, is a Gaussian, which lives in the scale of root N. But now remember that sites K and I will differ from, e from each other by R flipped spins. So their energy difference is a sum of R independent random terms, which means that the conditional distribution for epsilon K, given epsilon I, epsilon, epsilon I here to be zero in the center of the band, is lives on the scale of root R. And root R is perfectly finite of the Hamming distance is finite. So you can see immediately here that in the thermodynamic limit, the energies of the Fox space sites at some finite distance from each other on the Fox space graph are completely slaved to each other. And the consequences of this we'll look at in just a second. So what we're saying here is that the uh, problem is fully specified by the joint distribution of the Fox space site energies, given in the usual form here, uh, epsilon here. This, this term is a, a row vector of, of length uh, NH containing all the Fox space sites. And C is the covariance matrix, which completely specifies the distribution. So the IK element of that co covariance distribution is the average of epsilon i times epsilon k minus the product of the averages. I take it that is my reference for zero. And an important point that one can prove here, uh, and one can prove it in some cases analytically, and in other cases one could demonstrate it numerically, is that the matrix elements of the covariant matrix depend only on the Hamming distance between the pairs of sites that you're looking at. So the question then is, what's the general form for the covariance? And that's easy enough to, to deduce. Let's first of all consider the case of a Hamming distance R of zero. In other words, K is equal to I. R is equal to zero here in this uh, covariance. Uh, K is equal to I. And in that case, as we pointed out earlier, the, this is the variance of the one body side energy distribution. It scales linearly with the system size N and it must have some overall dimension of energy squared. So there's some effect of W squared there in terms of units. And then the other quantity here, rho of R and N is the reduced covariance matrix. It's just C of R divided by C of R equal to zero. And the dependence of the reduced covariance matrix on the Hamming distance is, is, is all the Hamming distance dependent is contained in this object. But what one finds and can show is that for a general P-spin system, the reduced covariance matrix, which depends on the Hamming distance and the number of sites in the problem, N is generally a pth order polynomial, which satisfies the condition that rho of R and N tends to one when the ratio R over N tends to zero. So here, for example, is both some numerics and a, an analytical formula in the, in the red dashed line for C of R over C of zero. It's for the disordered transverse field Ising model. The reduced covariance C of R over C of R equal to zero contains a quadratic term and one minus two R over N, R is the Hamming distance, N is the total number of sites and a linear term in the same with coefficients A here, I've been noticed in one minus A, which depend on the microscopic parameters. So for example, WH squared here is the variance of the random field. WJ squared is the variance of the random uh, interaction and JZ is the constant background component to that interaction. And you can see then that for any finite Hamming distance R, in the thermodynamic limit that n tends to infinity, that rho tends to a plus one minus a, rho in other words tends to one in that limit. Now, there's one other extremely important feature of this distribution that I want to point out, which is as follows. For the distribution to be well-defined in the thermodynamic limit, n tends to infinity, you need to rescale the Fox space side energies as epsilon tilde equals epsilon over root n. That fundamentally is reflecting the fact that these objects live in the scale of root n, but you can see it immediately here by recalling 
that the general covariance scales linearly with n. So there's a one over n factor in each term here. I need to distribute it as a root n between the constituent box space segments. So you need to rescale the energies by root n in the thermodynamic limit in order that the joint distribution of Fox space side energies remains well defined in that limit. This is going to be important. I'll come back to it shortly. So the problem then is fully specified by the joint distribution of these rescaled Fox space side energies. The covariance matrix completely specifies that distribution. So we could do the following. We could take the Fox space graph that is particular to our particular problem, specify the covariance matrix and study the problem uh, generally in those terms. And if we did that, there will be two evident radically different limits that arise in the problem. The first is the local models that I've discussed so far, where the reduced covariance matrix tends to one for any finite Hamming distance R in the thermodynamic limit. In that case, the D-body distribution of the Fox space side energies are all slaved to each other. It boils down to the, uh, the distribution of any one of them times a product of delta functions, which ensure that they're all exactly the same. This is what we call the maximally correlated disorder case. The Fox space side energies are completely slaved to each other. But we could go perfectly reasonably within this general framework to the complete diametrically opposite limit embodied in the so-called quantum random energy model, where the Fox space side energies are a priori treated as being completely uncorrelated for each and every spin configuration. That would mean that the covariance, the reduced covariance is zero for all having distances other than zero itself. And that in turn means that the joint distribution of the Fox space side energies is just the product of the probability, the one, the one body a probability test. Of course, as we know, the quantum random energy model lacks an MBL transition, either at the band center or for any finite energy, E tilde equals E over root N, away from the band center. Remember that the density of states lives on the scale set by root n. So let's just think about that. We've got two diametrically opposed extremes. We can treat the problem in a common way from this Fox space perspective. Uh, what can we say about the problem? So how does a state that's initially localized in some Fox space site spread out when we switch on the hobbings, if you will, so that's encoded quite generally in the Fox space propagators, generally off diagonal Fox space propagators, but the local Fox space propagator will suffice here. We study it not directly in, in the time domain, analytically rather, we study it not directly in the time domain, but in the frequency or energy domain, the eigenstate resolve domain, where it is the following usual representation where eta here is just the regulator, it's a positive infinitesimal. Now, if you'd absolutely no hopping, if there were no connections between the nodes in the Fox space graph, then GI of omega would simply be one over omega minus the Fox space center. So the self-energy, which I've introduced here, the Friedberg self-energy is basically accounting for the role of the hoppings in this problem. And you can separate that self-energy into a real and an imaginary term. It's the imaginary term that is the important part because that physically gives us the rate of loss of probability from a Fox space side I into eigenstates of energy omega, which overlap that particular Fox space side. And this object is, is, is key if you want to think about it in general, because it acts as a probabilistic order parameter for the associated transition. In a delocalized phase, uh, this delta I, the imaginary part of the self energy will be non-vanishing with unit probability, whereas in a localized phase, it will be vanished. So you can imagine, Coming from a delocalized phase, this object will be distributed. We'll have some probability distribution, take a typical value of it. Typical value will be finite in the, in the ergodic phase and will vanish as you approach uh, the critical disorder strength. In the localized phase, delta remains vanishing. In fact, delta is proportional to the regular. And one could show that simply by asking about perturbative connectivity to the strong disorder network. So this is all completely general, but how do we actually do anything with it even approximately in practice? Oh, before I go, sorry, one important point. Let's just perform a very simple estimate of how this quantity delta depends on N, the system size, deep in the ergodic phase. So we're deep enough in the ergodic phase, we can use a simple Fermi golden rule argument to estimate 
the behavior of the typical delta. So Fermi's golden rule will tell you that this will be gamma squared, the square of the, of the hopping or the coupling of Fox space, times the number of channels you have, the number of Fox space sites to which you connect, which is obviously n, times the density of states, density of eigenstates on energy scale omega. But that density of eigenstates, remember, is a Gaussian, a normal distribution. So that means that the density of states in scale omega must go as one over root n, the scale on which the density of states live. So that's telling us that delta is proportional to root n. So for the problem, again, to remain finite in the thermodynamic limit, the energy needs to be rescaled by root n, exactly as we had before for the Fox space side energies. And indeed, if you think about it, given that you need to scale the Fox space side energies here by root n and corresponding energies by root n, it would be shocking if you didn't have to <laughs> rescale uh, the self energies by exactly the same. All right, so now how do we actually handle this in practice, at least approximately? So we begin here with what is known as Feinberg's renormalized perturbation theories. It's a completely general technique. It's applicable to any graph or a tight binding model on any graph, including the Fox space graph we're considering. And structurally what it does is it relates the self energy on some given side I, it's the imaginary part of that I want, hence me writing delta I here, to the Feinberg self energies of the Fox space sites K, to which I is coupled under the hoppings. And those in turn are related to their sites to which they couple and so on. So clearly self-consistency is necessarily of the essence. So anything with a tilde, remember we have to rescale all energies by root n, anything with a tilde on it here uh, has a one over root n in it here. So Tik tilde, for example, is Tik over root n. In other words, when Tik is non-zero, it's gamma over root n. Epsilon k tilde is epsilon over root n and so on and so forth. And the simple mean field theory that we construct here consists of three essential steps in which the correlations are deeply important. So the first is that we simply replace the Feinberg self energy here by its typical value, S typical. We don't know it, we'll find itself consistently in just a moment. Having done that, you then obtain the probability distribution of delta I tilde itself from the joint distribution of the Fox space side energies in, of sites K to which I is coupled by a standard a relation here. And this, of course, is precisely when the information about the correlation between the Fox space side energies uh, get built in to the problem. And then having determined that distribution, you impose self-consistency by requiring that the typical value of the distribution you've just calculated should coincide with your input delta typical. And you do enforce that self-consistency at the level of a geometric mean. You may say, why at the level of geometric mean? And the answer is because the distributions in the MDL phase, and as you approach the transition from the ergodic side, are fat tailed, they're long tailed distributions. And so the geometric mean is the appropriate object for self consistency. So let's just think what that generates. We have here uh, a sum over Fox space sites K that are some finite Hamming distance away from the Fox space site I in which we're interested. As I pointed out before, if we have local Hamiltonians with this maximally correlated disorder, the Fox space energies of the sites K to which you're coupled differ from that of I by some order of one number, order omega. The distribution of the bare site energies lives in the scale of root n. The conditional distribution for epsilon K given epsilon I lives in the scale of root R. So if I rescale my energies as epsilon tilde over root n, uh, the, the conditional distribution for epsilon k, given the epsilon i to which we couple, shrinks, right, vanishes in the thermodynamic limit here. And the upshot of that, as you can see, is that your self energy reduces to just a single term. There are n terms in here, so this just becomes epsilon k tilde as epsilon i tilde by the arguments just given here. This reduces to just a single term, where n times t i k tilde squared is just the square of the bare order one hopping that you have in the problem. And now you can enact your self-consistency procedure. And when you do that, you will find that there is generically both an MBL phase that's stable and an ergodic phase is stable. You could look at the limits of stability of those two phases as you approach the transition from either side. You get, when you do that, a common a critical disorder and an MBL transition.
However, if we look by contrast at the quantum random energy model, where we have completely uncorrelated Fox space disorder, because of the lack of correlation by construction, the joint distribution for an epsilon k tilde given some epsilon i tilde is just the one body distribution itself. And so what that means that this sum then is a sum of an extensive number of terms that are of course independent because the epsilon k tildes are independent of the epsilon i tildes by construction in this model. But this of course is just a standard Anderson localization problem on an infinite dimensional graph, so uncorrelated random energies. And from that, we know that the localized phase can never be self consistently stable. So just to summarize where I am here, uh, if we look at the case of so-called maximal correlation, where the reduced covariance matrix rho of for any finite Hamming distance r tends to one in the thermodynamic limit where the number of sites tends to infinity, then that's the case, your disorder of local Hamiltonians, and one can have uh, an MBL phase exist. By contrast, if we look at the opposite extreme as embodied in the QRM of no correlation, then no many body localized phase exists. So you can ask yourself what, what then happens in the generic intermediate case. Remember, rho of R can only live between zero and one. So covariance matrix has to lie only in that interval in order for it to be positive semi-definite. You can ask what happens if you look at the generic case where rho of R is less than one, and one could show in that case by an extension of the arguments that I've just given you, that once again, it is not possible to have a stable MBL phase by virtue of the end scaling of the problem. So what one concludes there is then that MBL is possible only if you have this maximal, maximally disordered correlations, only if Fox space side energies, finite Hamming distances away from each other uh, are maximally correlated. Any independence of, in them by contrast, whether it's total, or partial leads to delocalization. <clears throat> and so finally here, having identified maximally correlated disorder, the seeming to play a significant role in this perspective of MBL based on, on the Fox space, we're now going to ask what's the effect of maximally correlated disorder in the context of Anderson localization. This is arguably a more controlled setting, right? Certainly from a numerical point of view, it's much more controlled. And this is what we now want to ask in a paper that was published uh, just about Christmas time. All right, so we've done this in the context of, of Cayley trees and regular random graphs. Uh, and what I've shown here, I'm just going to focus on the Cayley trees, is a rooted Cayley tree with some root site denoted by i equal to zero. And I've shown it here for a connectivity or a branching number equal to three. So what we want to do is consider a disordered type binding model on the tree with hopping strength gamma side energy is epsilon i. And we know that if we have uncorrelated randomness, right, as is the case of standard Anderson localization on tree-like structures, that the critical disorder goes as gamma times k log k. So now what we want to ask is, what's the fate of localization in the presence of maximal, maximally disordered correlations? And for that, we need to consider a, 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 a covariance as indicated here which is a function of Rij over L, where Rij is the distance between the sites on the graph, the tree is indicated here, and L is the number of generations of the tree, such that f of x as x goes to zero goes to one. Now, as you can see here, we get increasing system size. This means that the energies of nearby sites on the tree become more and more uniform. And so in suppressing fluctuations of the site energies in this way, you might naively suppose that these correlations would strongly favor delocalization. So it's not obvious that there should exist at all a localized phase with this maximally correlated disorder. So how do we handle this problem? Well, here's an exact result, exact result for the Feinberg renormalized perturbation theories. It's an exact result for the self-energy of the root site zero. It's given by this formula here, I'll talk you through in a moment. Remember gamma squared is the hopping. If there's no hopping, the self energy is zero. That would mean that an eigenstate would remain localized forever on, on the roots. And the object that appears in the denominator here is the Feinberg self energy for a site on generation one with 
the root side zero completely removed from the problem, which is what the little superscript zero indicates. But of course, if we remove the root side zero from the problem on the tree, this turns side I1 into a root side itself, which means we can iterate the expression as indicated there. And as you can see, this continued fraction taken to all orders down the tree is accounting for all of the correlated side energy. So epsilon I1 here, that's the energies of all the sites of the first generation, you sum over it, likewise epsilon I2, summed over all sites of the second generation, and so on and so forth. And you can see that all of the correlated side energies are taken into account in this way. So instead of a self-consistent theory, because you could go far beyond it in this context, you look instead for the convergence properties of the continued fraction. So if that series converges for a given energy omega, then states of energy omega remain localized in the vicinity of the root side. And in that case, the ratio of delta naught over the regulator, what I'll call y naught, is fine. And when one access numerically, you do find very clearly that there is a localized phase in this problem. There is a critical disorder strength there. I've shown it as a function of, of energy here. It's more or less exactly the same as you would get for uh, the, the regular random graph, which we've also studied. And this gives us insight into a number of things. So for example, when you're in the localized phase of the problem, one of the predictions that arises is that the distributions of these quantities delta naught over eta should be a fat tail levy distribution, a levy alpha stable distribution with levy alpha parameter of a half, meaning that when y naught, which is delta over eta, is much greater than some characteristic scale parameter kappa in the distribution that you expose these long y naught to the minus three half scales. And you can see this is on a log scale. This is exactly what you're getting when you do your numerical calculations for various different sizes of the generations of, of the tree. And by the way, the gray background there shows a pure Levy distribution. This really is what arises the problem. But finally, then let me just talk briefly about the scaling of this problem with the connectivity K of the tree. So uh, basically from our mean field theory and various other arguments, our deduction is that the critical disorder in this maximally correlated scale case scales with as gamma, the hopping, times root K. And that's very different from what we know in the uncorrelated case where we know the critical disorder goes as gamma times K log K. Now, as anyone working in one body localization in high dimensions knows, or anybody who knows about dynamical mean field theory knows, if you want any one body problem to be well-defined in the limit that the coordination number or quality space dimension tends to infinity, not to be dominated trivially by kinetic energy, then you need to rescale the hopping gamma by gamma goes to gamma star uh, over root k. And when you do that, as you can see, uh, in the uncorrelated case, this just means that wk goes as gamma star times root k log k, which again diverges as k goes to infinity. There's no localized states in the uncorrelated standard case in the large k limit, but for the maximally correlated case, the critical w will go to a finite value. And you'll notice that it's interesting to compare that with the standard case, the case rather that we talked about in the context of many body localization. You have here again, a, a critical disorder strength that's of order one, right? You have here a critical disorder strength that's scaling as root k log k. And indeed, if I replace k, the connectivity by n, right, which would be extensive on a Fox space graph, this would give me the critical scaling going as root n log n, which is indeed a belief. All right, so I'm probably uh, running out of time. So let me just, while I, I leave the summary slide, I mean, I've, I've, I've talked what I've talked about. That's just a summary of, of what I have talked about. But there are, of course, many, many, many outstanding questions uh, that arise. So can we, for example, connect the kinds of Fox space approaches I've been talking about here to results arising from the phenomenological treatments I mentioned earlier, avalanches, bubbles, things of that sort? Can we connect the microscopic theory uh, on Fox space to real space space pictures? Can we construct a Fox space space theory of eigenstate expectation values of spatially local observables, which thereby relates something that's spatially local observables in real space to an underlying Fox space description? And finally, can we say anything about the emergence of a correlation or localization length on the Fox space? 
about their behavior at each of the two phases and about their critical behavior as we cross the transition. So I'd like simply to point out what I think is a really very nice paper that deals with the, the first two aspects of this by just the Massey, uh, Ivan Kamovich, Frank, and, and, and Simone Vorsel, which has been in the archive since November. And uh, Stephen D. Roy and I will in the next uh, couple of weeks, two or three weeks, put up a paper called Fox Space Landscapes Across the MBL Transition, which will deal with in particular aspects of the latter two in, in this set of outstanding questions. So once again, uh, let me just acknowledge and say thank you to the people with whom I've had the pleasure of working. Stephen D. Roy primarily, as far as the work concerned here is concerned, Stash Welsh, a graduate student of John Chalker, with whom I've uh, uh, worked in some other problems in this area, although not which I've talked about today. We've had helpful discussions with many people, uh, and fun discussions with many people. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you. I can't hear you, Daryl. You're, you're muted. Sorry, I was forgetting to unmute myself. So thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, we have quite enough time for questions, so please. Okay, we have a first question from Pranay. Uh, please unmute yourself. Hi, yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. I had a question about the choice of basis. Yeah. So it seems like for, okay, so you uh, consider the transfer realizing and you go with the Z basis. Uh, is, is it motivated by the fact that you put the disorder in the Z terms? Yeah, it, 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 it's motivated by the fact that that basis connects to the strong disorder limit. That's the natural basis you'd have in the strong disorder limit. You're yes. absolutely right. You could choose different bases, and we have actually in some other studies chosen different bases, but that's the natural basis to choose physically because at the strong disorder limit, that's the that's the, the, the you know the, the, the product state basis that you expect to adopt. Right. So then in that case, so in the transverse field, I think you assume that the sigma x term has something that is has a coefficient which is translation invariant. And if I consider some more convoluted Hamiltonian where I have uh, disorder coefficients in the coefficients for, for example, in the sigma x and in the sigma in the sigma z, yep. then I would have to choose a basis which is uh, sort of local basis which is rotated in the correct manner so that it. Uh, That's right. I mean, it would be expedient to make such a rotation. I agree. Although in principle, you could still do it in the way that I've described it. There, it's just that your hopping matrix elements on the graph would then become random if there were randomness in the couplings, which I call gamma for the sigma x terms. Right, but it doesn't change anything in the conclusions. It, it, it doesn't, right. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, we have another question from Peter Karpov, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you. Um, you. You mentioned that uh, important properties that distinguish uh, like typical many body uh, graphs yes. is that uh, typically they have uh, macroscopic connectivity. Yes. And like uh, single body problems. So you wonder about the word uh, typically. So do you like um, do you uh, exceptions? I, 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 I understood. So and that's a good question. So perhaps I should have uh, slowed down on that. So for, for the disorder transverse field Ising model that I was talking about, the connectivity of each and every node is precisely n. Okay. But for the XXZ model, right? Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to try and go. Uh, I'm going to try back here if I can do it. Let me just show you that picture. I think this is what you're referring to here. So for the XXZ model, right, as you see there, there's a distribution of these coordination numbers. So the topmost site here, the apex, has just got a, a, a single domain wall, right, as indicated there. The, the bottom one is the flipping of that domain wall. And you can see that that has a coordination number of one. So in this case, the coordination numbers are anywhere from one to I think it's 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 n, okay? But they're characterized by a distribution, and the distribution in this case is peaked at n over two, and it lives at the scale of root n, okay? So it's tightly, quite tightly distributed in the scale of root n, and one could encompass those perfectly well. So you're quite right 
generic graphs will have a distribution of connectivities as that there indicates. But the important point is that the typical value in the sense of the mode is proportional to n, and indeed the variance of them, or, or rather the standard deviation of them, lives in the root n scale. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I understand. So, so like my question is, uh, well, a bit towards uh, previous uh, talk of, of uh, Frank Pullman, like say if you have like very constrained model, so well, maybe you expect something different. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, okay. I, I would have to think about it to be quite honest. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions? Okay, so maybe I can I can ask a question. I mean, uh, is this I mean another let's say controversial or let's say debate about many body localization is about the existence of the of the many body uh, mobility edge in the yes. thermodynamic. Yes, limit. yes, yes, yes. Good. Is uh, this Fox space approach uh, useful in any way to well, address? Uh, so so let me say something here, which which I think is really uh, so I, I think. Now, remember, the transition is an eigenstate phase transition. Okay? Mm -hmm. It is occurs on an eigenstate by eigenstate phase. And remember, I pointed out that the density of eigenvalues, right, has a standard deviation that goes as root n. Mm -hmm. So the spectrum lives at the scale of root n, it does not live at the scale of n. So I think okay. major misconception that has arisen in the literature, or major misconceptions, I understand why it's done, is to plot energies as energy densities, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a E max, or E minus E min over E max minus E min, energy densities, which is scaling energy within. Of course, you do that in the context of thermodynamics, we understand why we do, but you're talking about eigenstate phase transitions here. The density of states lives on a scale set by root n. And therefore, the notion of mobility edges can only have meaning on that scale of root n. Now, of course, if you're doing numerics, numerics is going to have a very hard time distinguishing <laughs> distinguish certainly between root n sure. and n uh, in, in mobility edges. But it really is the scale of root n on which you should be talking or thinking of mobility edges, because that is the scale on which the density of eigenvalues live. OK. I see. It's as simple as that. I mean, it, 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 they live at the scale of root n, and you want to think of a mobility edge, a putative mobility edge is existing, then that mobility edge will scale through the spectrum at the scale at which the spectrum lives, and that scale is set by root n and not by n. If you want it to scale by n, your density of states will be a delta function at zero. I see. I see. OK. OK. Any other uh, questions? Uh, yes, Sergey. Yeah, uh, David, I, I want to come back to this uh, what you, statement you just made and uh, yeah. uh, the, uh, the old paper by Altschuler and uh, Basco and Dalener, where they state that there is a critical, um, where they claim that there is a critical temperature. So temp yeah. temperature is density. So how do I understand now your comment that uh, it's no. wrong? No. No. I, I, right. So Everything I've talked about here is, if you will, infinite temperature, right? I, I'm, I'm simply going to the limit where I'm working in the full spectrum of states of the Hamiltonian. That's effectively infinite temperature. So I can't say anything just because I don't know how to say anything about finite temperatures, right? With this kind of approach, right? Without assuming something about thermal equilibrium, which I don't want to assume, right? But uh, what, what I can say is that uh, I don't believe, uh, sorry, Sergey, what, what was the essential? Uh, my question was just that uh, in this old uh, 2005 oh, yeah, paper, no, 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 of course. There, there was a claim that this MBL leads to a critical temperature at which you see a transition. And that uh, to no. me sounds like I have a critical density. That sounds to me like, uh, and, and that's what you, uh, what you were uh, yeah. uh, so saying. So I, I, I'm talking about way to view. So I'm talking here only about infinite temperature regime. And when you're at infinite temperature, the problem is effectively a zero temperature quantum phase transition. You okay. deal with the full spectrum of states in the Hamiltonian, right? 
There's no thermal selection of those states. You're just dealing with the full spectrum of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, and you're picking your eigenstates and you're asking are those eigenstates of anybody localized or are they ergodic, right? In that sense, the problem here is much more like regular quantum phase transitions that you consider at zero temperature. Thermal fluctuations are playing no role. When thermal fluctuations do play a role, I don't have anything to say about it because I don't know how to handle it myself. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we have another we have another question from Kisok Kim. Kisok, please unmute. Yes, thank you. What is the role of space dimension here? How can you introduce yeah, so, in two dimensions, yeah, three dimensions? So, so everything I've said here is about 1D. Um, it, it, I, I, uh, are you asking me what my view is on, on higher dimensions? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I think there is no difference in this Fox space formulation. Oh, the Fox space I mean, formulation, yeah, the Fox uh, space formulation could be done in higher dimensions, yes? Yes, so then, you yeah, what's the difference in 1D and higher dimensions? What the minimally localization in this description? So th there is essentially no difference except that everything I've talked about has been 1D. I can't say anything about higher dimensions. I mean, the uh, certainly you could always write a Fox space graph, right? Uh, if your underlying real space problem is any space dimensionality, that can absolutely be done. Uh, what can I say about it? Nothing tangible. I mean, I, I, you know, my gut instinct is that, is that a many body localized phase, well, my gut instinct is that it does exist in higher dimensions, but I'm not able to say about anything about it in, in this treatment. So a lot of what I've told you about the specific form for the covariance matrices, et cetera, really stems from calculations based on the, the, there being a one dimensional background Hamiltonian, right? I don't know how those generalize to higher space dimensions. But certainly, one can in principle study the problem on Fox space if in real space it lives in higher dimensions. How you would do that numerically, if you take numerical line in the thing, would be very tricky, but one could in principle do it. I see. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you, Kisok. Uh, are there any other uh, questions or comments uh, or? Okay, it looks, I don't see any other uh, raise hand. So maybe it's time to stop the colloquium. Uh, let's thank again our speaker and yeah, probably we can stop here the colloquium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so this was also uh, the last talk of today of today's session. So I thanks everybody for uh, joining the, the conference, joining the workshop and uh, participating. And I hope to see you again tomorrow for the last day of our workshop. Okay, thank you very much. You will.